I'd just like to explain that there's one element missing from this evening. I wanted to begin with a very short clip from an Antonioni film that David Bash showed me recently, um, in which you see Monica Vitti uh, in a rather darkened room, um, fooling around in a, in a room in some ambiguous relation to the camera. Um, just when you're beginning to be absorbed in her activity, the Marcello Mastriani, or rather the image of Marcello Mastriani, uh, enters the frame and actually overlaps her in such a way that you realize that either he or she is virtual. You can't quite make out the frame of reference, nor can you quite make out the depth of field. And then, in a continuous move, the camera uh, pans to the right and in a quite separate but somehow ambiguously connected space, the real Viti and the real Mastroianni come together um, and resume the dialogue. Um, I wanted to show it, but technically we couldn't tonight, because it seemed to sum up um, a certain kind of generic scene in John's work. Um, I've been following John's work for some time now. Um, I think I first encountered it in 1972. Was it the New Art exhibition at the Hayward Gallery? Um, and then, and that, that was in the context, I suppose, of the British introduction, at the public level anyway, of, of conceptual art. But then he seemed to be part of um, a, a group of artists in the 70s who I think have never been quite uh, brought together as a movement, let's say who were dealing with the photographic image without themselves really being part of the photographic art tradition. Um, and I'd mentioned John, John Stesica and, for instance, Victor, Victor Bergen in, in the same sort of uh, movement. But they've all gone in their different ways. And I think perhaps of the three, John Hilliard has most uh, consistently explored the actual technical space of, of the camera. And um, for that reason, it, in a certain kind of way, he's become, I think, actually, the most architecturally germane of, of that group. And I think that's one reason why uh, we welcome him here tonight. So, thanks, John. Um, I don't really think of myself as being architecturally germane, by the way. I hope you're going to hear something articulate from me because I've been doing interviews all day down the road at the Slate since 9 o'clock this morning, and uh, I really haven't had time to think about this. Anyway, um, as, as this is at the AA, and um, even though this is a series of public lectures, and even though I know it's a program of talks by artists without any expectation that they necessarily relate directly to architecture. Nevertheless, um, I have made a selection of work to talk about, a very particular selection, by no means an attempt to give you a complete overview of what I do or what I have done. But, but it is in this context. Um, OK, let me see if I can start this off. I can start it off. This title, Depth of Field, is actually a title that Brian concocted originally for a talk I gave at the RCA recently to architecture students. and. Uh, for various reasons, I really thought, A, I don't have a lot of time to uh, consider doing something radically different, and B, it, it did seem equally appropriate to this venue. Um, now, what I thought of reflecting on this notion, depth of field, which I took to be an idea concerning the way we construct and perceive space and therefore having some connection to the architectural. I actually thought of it in three ways with regard to my own practice. 
The first way I thought of it as being quite literal, a depth of field in connection to the spectator's own ambient condition, perambulating around the work within a particular defined space. Secondly, I thought of depth of field more conventionally in relation to photography or film, thinking of a space which is constructed optically, where one's engagement is essentially with an image in optical and cerebral space. And thirdly, with regard to my own uh, development in this regard, a denial of everything that preceded it, a, a sort of refutation of that very space that would allow for perambulation through a depth of field, either literal or imaginary. So um, my, I mean, the other thing that might possibly connect me to a sense of the architectural is my own beginning as someone working originally with sculpture, as Brian just said, artists of my own generation using photography tended not to have come from photography and not to have photographic training, but to have come from somewhere else, and in my case, from sculpture. The, the last things I did, which I would describe as belonging to the sculptural, were very site-specific. They were made for very particular interior spaces and were deliberately put together in the most discreet way I could imagine. The idea being that they somehow engaged the spectator in a participatory way, in a complete space, and yet were not invasive on the space itself. This is a work called Spotlight Above, Fluorescent Below. Now the only physical intervention here, really, is the, this cut between the joists of a ceiling on the left in a room below, looking upwards, and between the floorboards of the room ab above, looking downwards. The two rooms contain nothing except the source of light that illuminates them. And these lights happen to be different, and yet equally conventional, and equally invisible, if you have no point of comparison. So on the floor above, spotlight, the floor below, a fluorescent light. The spotlight, of course, happens to be extremely yellow. The fluorescent light happens to be extremely blue. You're not aware of this unless you looked downwards from above, towards and through that hole, or conversely, upwards from below. Then the two kinds of light, far more vivid in the original than we see here, and here only available, of course, photographically now. Um, if you like, that's when we see, we're aware of, we're within the work, two cubes of differently colored light. Now, what I really wanted to do was go on directly to um, a rather different slide, but instead I'm going to go to this, just to mention something. Now, I put this in in anticipation that Brian was going to have been able to show this film clip. Um, and, of course, we haven't seen it. But uh, there, is, there is a connection in my work to cinema. And there is another reason at this moment for showing this. The, the photographic, originally used by me in an ordinarily documentary way, a means of recording and retaining works like the one I showed, made in 1970, um, but, al but also secondarily as a first-order medium. Now, as a first-order medium, it seemed to me photography was limited by its normal size and its normal surfaces. And I wanted somehow to escape that for a number of reasons, partly to escape the reflectivity of photography to escape the relative smallness of scale and to make an explicit gesture towards some sources of influence that were present in my own work. Things like advertising, billboards, 
things like painting, the large-scale painting of, let's say, the post-war period, and something like cinema. This is about six meters wide. So, you know, you can see immediately this escapes the normal confines uh, expected of photography. It's not a photographic surface. It's uh, a very large scale inkjet print in acrylic onto canvas. So, you know, we've got this painting reference again. And this, um, this actually is photographed in my living room. So it's on the living room wall. In that kind of space, this has relatively a rather overwhelming scale, comparable, it seemed to me, to the scale of the cinema screen and to the scale of the billboard. The, uh, the image, also in this case, a little unusually for me, makes explicit reference to some films. The character on the left in fact, the artist Bruce McLean is constructed in my mind as a hybrid of Tony Curtis in Some Like It Hot and Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver with a little bit of Alan Ladd thrown in because he's standing on a box being relatively small in order to elevate himself sufficiently highly to be reflected in the window. This whole situation where, very simply, we've got exactly the same shot repeated, one with the camera totally still, a rapidly moving car going past in front with the reflected image, the gunman, available on that moving sheet of glass because the camera is still in relation to its equally still object, regardless of the fact that the reflective surface is in motion. On the right, the opposite. This time, the camera pans rapidly, like a sports shot, to follow the car and captures the front passenger, the man with the camera, and loses the reflected gunman. So there's a kind of inverse retrieval and loss of an image. This situation where two shots might potentially be made is referencing a famous piece of news footage, documentary footage, where in South America a cameraman, film cameraman, a news cameraman, faces a soldier who we, watching the subsequent film, see raise his gun towards us, towards the cameraman, fire. The whole film tilts over. The cameraman is dead. He's filmed his own death. He's actually invited his own death. It's something which is then quoted in um, a film by Wim Wenders, The State of Things. So this was all kind of in my mind when I made this piece. I, as I said, such a literal reconstruction is unusual for me. Now, having said that, I'm going to contradict myself immediately. The reason, apart from that film reference, which uh, we sort of missed, the reason for showing this work now, immediately after that uh, piece of sculptural work I showed initially, is because the spectator is now once again, similarly, 15 years later, invited to look up and to look down. And what I'm doing, really, is trying to place the spectator in literally and figuratively the point of view from which this image is made. Now, there's something else to say about this, and the other reason I showed that, um, that last work, which is called Moment. This use of um, a scanned image onto a non-photographic surface gave a very mural-like result. And I wanted to extend that more literally into an architectural space. And this is in um, a place in Austria. It's, it's a castle. It's called Schloss Buchberg. Um, and in this, in this building, the owners have invited numerous artists to go there and um, make a work specifically and permanently for the site. So when I was invited there, I was shown a room. 
and the room we're looking directly up towards the ceiling in this shot had a sort of classic uh, plaster molding defining a rectangle in the ceiling. So I thought, of course, this is something I'm going to use and I'm going to make a kind of contemporary fresco. But I had no idea what I would do. And then I, I went away to think about it and thought what I'd like to do somehow is incorporate the floor into the ceiling. And how do you do that? Well, using a mirror is a way to do it. So I decided to use a room to generate my images where there was a mirrored ceiling and in what circumstances might that be and so on. So the, the thinking process led me to a memory of another picture. So this is, I'm saying I'm contradicting myself immediately and here I am referring even more specifically to uh, an existing image. The, the other picture is, is quite well known. It's, it's an image by the fashion photographer Helmut Newton and it's the introduction to one of his books which is called White Women. In the front of the book, we see a picture very similar to this, and it's quite perplexing, I think, because it's a directly overhead view, and you think, how could it have been made? And then you notice that Helmut Newton has a camera to his eye, just like I have here. And of course, he made the picture. He could only have made the picture into a mirrored ceiling. So I decided to, this was my, my kind of stepping off point. So when we now look in Schloss Buchberg, we enter this room, we look at this ceiling. I think we go through, sorry, I think we go through a similar process of thinking and we're led to a similar conclusion. Ah, you know, the man in the picture with his camera took this shot and it must have been into a mirror. This is looking down at the floor. So, you know, as with that very early piece, we're obliged to look up and look down and have a different perception and make a kind of comparison between the two experiences. Looking down, uh, I know this, this slide's actually landscape, not portrait, but the, the two images are identical in size. They're each um, two by three meters. Sorry, they're each three by six meters. It's quite big, this. Um, and they're, they're directly congruent with each other, above and below. They also use the materials of decor. This is a rather expensive white carpet with the image printed on it. The ceiling image is printed on Hessian wall covering material. In other words, something that belongs, bonded directly to a wall surface. Looking down, we seem to see the same shot and indeed it is a shot made in exactly the same moment in time of the same scenario except it is different the figures are in reverse geometry if we thought the first image was a mirror reflection inversing its image we must now think this image was made by direct observation the figures here are also bigger if we think a mirror diminishes its objects, and these are larger, again, seems to confirm they were observed directly. How is that possible? But there are other things in the picture to give you a clue. On the right, just beyond the man's arm, there's something that was not in the first picture. And it's actually one leg of a tripod. I don't know how easy it is for you to see this, but down the, from your point of view, the woman's left leg, there is a long dark cord and it leads out of the shot. It is a very long cable release. The mechanism to make this picture, rather as the camera making the other picture, is visible within the image. That mechanism now is visible in this image. It's the supporting mechanism for a second camera. The two-way mirrored ceiling because that's what it is it's not a not a an ordinary mirrored ceiling supports above it a second camera on a tripod and you know I'm sure you all know how these devices work that if the room below is fully illuminated then the ceiling from there is simply a mirror from above in a darkened space 
the ceiling is totally a window. So it allows. So I, what, what I thought I'd done was turn around the original image, not just left to right and not just top to bottom, but also in its reading. If we think in the original, the photographer, the perpetrator of the gaze, is the voyeur towards the woman, then he, in this scenario, becomes a kind of victim, a sort of unwitting victim of this second camera. And the woman then perhaps is complicit in this luring of the man into this position. This is similar, and it, it also uses a similar device, you know, what I'm calling a two-way mirror, which I think, strictly speaking, is a one-way mirror, isn't it? Um, this also is sited in an architectural space. The image itself is three meters high. The entire wall is five meters high. Now, once again, as with the floor and ceiling, we can't actually see both images at the same time. We must actually walk around and around this wall to see what are actually back-to-back -back images. But I had the idea that you might encounter this image first, and you can see the room with this curved background. This is, this is the point of entry. Um, so walking in, you would simply see an image of this man with his back to you, combing his hair, facing a bathroom mirror, and the interior of the bathroom reflected in that mirror. If we walk around the back, we see, well, first of all, we see, we see rather a similar kind of posture, but a, a kind of inversion. The figure now is dark, not bright. Um, the figure is also in the opposite direction. Um, it's actually a, a woman, a rather androgynous woman, with short hair, behind the other side of the mirror, and she's looking directly into his eyes, and she mimics his own posture. She actually presses herself against the glass, but from his side, she's completely invisible. From his side, he sees narcissistically only his own image being beautified. She, longingly perhaps, or whatever, sees him um, as kind of unwitting recipient of her gaze. And this is, this is the last in this section that I spoke about, a kind of literal ambient space creating a kind of depth of field for the spectator to experience. This is actually, um, I, I have a, an exhibition at the moment in Austria in a city called Krems where in typical European fashion they've built what's now the largest contemporary uh, showing space in Austria, in a, in a relatively small city. And the, this museum is actually a former tobacco or cigarette factory. And curiously, some years before, in fact, uh, nine years before, in another uh, disused cigarette or tobacco factory in the same city, there was an exhibition of various European artists who were invited to make work for the space before it was, it's actually, it's actually now part of the university there, but before it was converted there was this exhibition. Um, now I, I realized that the, the way the building was constructed was that there were vertical columns all through um, supporting the, you know, each floor and that, that was the convention of the structure. And they were, they were square section columns, and I decided to uh, connect two pairs to make two parallel walls, to, to kind of complete them, if you like, into two parallel walls. And then have a device rather like the one I've just spoken about, where you must perambulate and adopt different points of view in order to perceive all the images. Uh, now, this exhibition had a very strange title, Das Glesner U-Boat, the glass submarine. I don't know why that was. I can't explain it to you. Nobody explained it to me. But someone had concocted this theme. 
So anyway, I, I went away and I thought about this and I thought about several parallel constructions. One was a greenhouse. I thought about greenhouses at night. I didn't use a greenhouse, I used a car. And I, I was thinking, you know, cars in, in large part are a kind of glass box on wheels, you know, the central section. And it, it, it's really what I needed. And um, of course the illumination is, is exaggerated, but you know, if, if you're sitting in a car at night in the middle of nowhere and you have the light on inside, the interior windows become like mirrors. But for someone outside looking in, a kind of uh, intruder, voyeur, whatever, the, the inhabitants of the car would be exposed and the, the, uh, the voyeur outside would be unseen. So, I, I mean, this, this was the construction I used. So, the, the parallel walls correspond to views from outside looking in through the front window, which, which is what this is. Then on the left, looking, f if you walk inside between the walls, from the inside looking back out, and what you see is the woman who was draped across the front seat here, um, sorry, I forgot to mention not only the woman across the front seat, but another woman looking in, uh, seen more or less in silhouette um, and unseen, invisible from inside, as you see, because from inside, what we see is that same woman on the front seat now reflected right across the interior of the front windscreen, rather anamorphically stretched, and then repeated facially in the rear view mirror. So she's there twice. Looking on the right outwards from the interior, actually at this point I've broken the mirror because there's a figure outside looking in with reverse illumination to the one looking in from the front. She's lit from directly below and from in front and has, has a rather uh, phantom-like appearance and then looking from her point of view, looking in through the rear window, we see this doll sort of tossed casually above the back seat and between stereo speakers. The, the work is actually called Transmission. Um, the, the clothing of the doll at the back is very comparable to the clothing worn by the woman in the front in terms of coloration. The two, the, there are only two women, actually. I use the same woman outside looking in the front and the back in different shots. The two women are sisters. So this construction of another self in different conditions runs right through this work. All right, now that's, that's the end of that section, this notion of depth of field in relation to a literal and ambient space for the spectator. These are not chronological. I'm going all over the place. Those works were essentially from the 80s. The first slide I showed was from 1970. These are from the mid-70s. And there's a, there's a very clear use of depth of field in this case. This is one of a triptych of images using a very, very shallow depth of focus. My, my reaction to having used photography as a documenting medium was almost immediately to question and to criticize that very use of the medium. So I, you know, on the one hand, I felt driven to use photography as a first order medium, not painting, not sculpture, but photography. But I also felt it was brought into question as a, as a medium of representation. So everything I do, I think, um, reflects this critical standpoint. So w one of the questions about representation for me was to do with, if you like, a form of editing of material. 
And one device for editing would be precisely this, a use of selective focusing to nominate something, in this case this head, and to relegate anything else in the field of view. And there's a text here. It says, he sat gazing at the mirror. Now, nothing's changed in this picture except the focus wheel of the camera has changed. And it's now focused on the surface of the mirror. I actually thought of this guy's head really um, rather unkindly, merely as an object in space. So focusing on the object, you get a certain perception of its identity. Focusing now in front of it, you get something else to compare it with. James, I love you so much, kisses in lipstick on that mirror. Absorbing the oily red letters, I'm not going to be able to read this. His eyes slid down over the glass, paused, then flicked back to the beginning. Isn't that right? I seem to remember. And then, sorry, yes, finally. Um, all the available evidence pointed to suicide, the second in the area that week. What, what I'm trying to do, and what this does now is give us a sense of what is behind this object in space by use of the mirror. And you can see what happens. This information in each case is always present. I mean, you can see the very, very elusive trace of that lipstick, but you can't read it anymore. It's all there, just as the policeman and the body were there in the other shots. So we, we have a different interpretation of the image. This rather pulp fictional text is also there in a, in a very self-conscious way to say, well, of course, this is all a setup. It's not for real. It's a kind of theater. So th this is another one, which I actually thought was an improvement, because the text now is more straightforwardly descriptive, but it also remains as a fixed entity. So in a sense, it's a more perfect model. Everything is a control except for this focus wheel. Nothing changes except that. And in changing now, it not only changes what we understand visually, it changes the way we interpret these words. And the words are, she observed her reflection in the glass. She, the woman on the right, observing herself in the picture glass, we assume. Well, as that picture is a reproduction of the Velasquez Roca be Venus, we now assume that this must refer to Venus's observation of herself, and we'll come back to that. And just ignoring that stain on the slide, uh, she observed her reflection in the glass. There's actually a second woman on the opposite side of the room behind the woman we saw first, and she now seems to be the object of this observation. Um, the reason I said we'll come back to that is that clearly if we see Venus reflected in that mirror, she could not possibly be looking at herself. She can only be looking at us and inviting us to look back at her. It's actually a very voyeuristic device. And my own use of the second woman being covertly viewed by the original woman on the right is a kind of restructuring of the content inherent within that reproduction. Now, um, this is from 1990, and clearly I'm kind of, you know, either, either I'm being very consistent or boringly repetitious, um, but what I'm doing now, using another uh, device inherent in the medium photography, and this, I think this is something else I do. I'm always trying to um, make use of the specific language of this medium, which is unlike that of other media. One of the things we 
can do with photography and something we perhaps associate it with is make multiple exposures onto a single piece of film. So this is what I've done here. Now, what, what I've also done is adopted a fixed point of view and confronted a fixed scenario. So the only distinction between three separate exposures, one on top of the other, on top of the other, is that I've changed the focus of the camera, just as I did in those previous works. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing really what I did then, except instead of separating out the layers, I'm actually laying them one on top of the other. I, th I think I felt, having gone through a long period of making work in at least two parts, or three parts, or four parts, or whatever, um, I was always trying to establish a mechanism for comparing and contrasting. You know, to say, if you make this picture like this, you have one sense of it. But you only have to change something very slight, make it like this, and it has a completely different reading. So I wanted to retain that um, some kind of comparative device, but within a single image to relieve the tedium of going from this to this, to, you know, kind of pedestrian in a way. So this, this, now like a lot of these works, I use a window to do this. And it's very convenient because of the nature of glass. It's simultaneously a visible surface, a reflective mirror, and a transparent medium. So what we have here is the, the woman in the center illuminated with yellow is inside a room. The woman on the left with spectacles with a blue illumination is outside. You can see all the bushes and everything in the garden looking in. The third woman, the shadow, is merely a projection on a very flimsy kind of neck curtain, effectively then opaquely in the picture plane. So we, you know, we can now read around between these three women and make some kind of conclusion. Now this, this is, um, I, I don't know if this, does this seem in sharp focus? Shall I put my glasses on? Um, yes. If it's in focus, that tells you something about my eyesight. So, um, you know, this obsession with focusing begins to fall into place, doesn't it? This, this similarly uses a, a window, and similarly the, um, and you, you see the title incorporated, remote. The woman on the left, blindfold, is inside. The woman on the right, looking down, is outside. The third gaze, the third figure, the camera, the movie camera, is merely there as a shadow. If you like, the male gaze, I would have thought, is there merely as a shadow. But no gaze is activated. The camera, if it's functioning, is set to remote. The woman outside who might look in chooses to look down. The woman inside can't look, being blindfolded, and can't look anyway because she's only a mannequin. So this notion of coolness and remoteness is being amplified by this scenario. This is using an aquarium rather like a window. You know, um, water is compressed, condensed visually by this device and acts as a separator between the figure on the right, the cat woman, it is a woman, disguised as a cat. The man on the left, who's actually on the other side of the aquarium, seen transparently through the water. And then the fish in the what I would call the picture plane, in the plane of the aquarium itself. Now, actually, the, the, fish is a, the fish on the right is a catfish. It's a predator. It will actually eat those goldfish, given half a chance, especially with the lights out. The man on the left, with his orange T-shirt, is deliberately constructed somewhat similarly to the fish. The woman on the right, with the cat mask, obviously has connection to the catfish. So she, she is in a predatory role, the role of captive, the man on the left, the role of a victim. 
Um, now, Brian is quite keen that uh, I should include this slide because somebody who's going to come and speak um, within the next, um, what, few weeks, Brian, I think, sometime in April, uh, Dan Graham, the American artist. Uh, about those, the, the works that I've just been showing, where a sheet of glass acts as a separator between often a man and a woman, and something which allows and encourages a kind of almost intimate connection, and yet forbids any actual contact. Dan said, um, you know, after some short pause for thought, this work's all about safe sex. You know, sort of, uh, which I thought was very amusing and in a way curiously correct. You know, curiously correct in the sense that it certainly was about this kind of uh, distance. You know, a distance which allowed, as I said, a kind of intimacy, but without contact and therefore without danger. Now, Dan Graham had um, installed one of his works outside the Serpentine Gallery at that time. And I thought it's a very good site for me to use um, you know, as a device. So I, I did use it. And this work is actually called Safe for Dan Graham. And it's, it's also quoting another image or, or various images which have been made around the story of Susanna and the elders. So the woman in the center is actually reflected in this glass partition, which is part of this pavilion. It's one of the walls. And actually observes directly herself, admiringly. The man immediately to her right is actually on the reverse side of this glass, which is half silvered. So he's able to observe her, scarcely seen and at a safe distance, the other side of the glass. The man to his right, peeking through the hedge, is actually on the same side as the woman, but he's behind the hedge. And so he's kind of peeking but he's also somewhat protected also. The hedges, if anybody saw this pavilion, the hedges also formed a kind of semi-transparent or translucent wall, just as the sheets of glass did in some cases. The third man is on the right of this picture and is inside that building looking out from the windows. He's, got, he's, he's quite brightly illuminated. He's also on the same side of the glass is the woman, and yet he's inside the Serpentine Gallery. So, you know, he's safe as well. So, you know, all of this is perfectly safe for Dan Graham. I, you know, this is no big deal. This is, a, you know, like a small piece of work. Um, but that theme of surveillance, of perhaps watching without being seen or watching from a safe position is also continued in something like this. This is actually uh, using a window which is formed from this classic security glass that you see at airports and in supermarkets and so on. The three men uh, in the middle, the large figures, are actually on a side of the glass where they're reflected in the strips of mirror, vert the vertical strips of mirror, the broad bands of mirror. The, uh, with three focal points connected, as I said, to the transparency, opacity, and reflectivity of the medium, and also corresponding somewhat to foreground, midground, and background within picturing, um, take as their focal points the men inside, you know, inside possibly more than one sense, of course, the, 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 the gaps between the strips of mirror themselves, so they, they read rather like bars now. And then this much more diverse, random group of people outside, different ages, different sexes, uh, different kinds.
kinds of clothing, and they're having a kind of party, you know, having a nice time, having a drink. Uh, they seem, and in this garden, they seem to be having a very different experience from the three figures in the front. This is, I, I, I won't say much about this. I mean, this is using a TV screen and its uh, picture disturbance and its movie Hitchcock film and its reflected interior, rather like I'm using a window. But um, I put it in because of this missing cinema connection. This is also using a window again and to do with surveillance. And I, I th what I really wanted to do was try and do something without people in uh, because it's such a drag organizing people to be in these pictures, to get them all in the same place at the same time. And uh, I wanted to do something using light as um, a, a sort of character, if you like. So the, the surface of the window has a shadow of a movie projector across it. The interior of that room with a desk with letters and tapes spread on it and drawers open has got a little office light on it. And then outside, uh, beyond, there's this figure in yellow, also with a light, a flashlight, searching in the exterior space. So it's, it's all about looking. It's all about searching for information. This, this also is crucially made with lights, you know, whatever else is um, going on there. The um, different kinds of light, and these are the lights not only that are read as part of the image, they also provide the image. They're necessary. If we switch out those lights, we've got no vision <coughs> and no picture. The, the light actually on the surface of the window, like a club sign or a bar sign, the heart with the arrow, is, is neon. The fire is fire. And the, the woman in red is illuminated with a kind of costume of red light. She's draped in an array of red tungsten bulbs. So we've got fire, tungsten, and neon. We've also got blue, red, yellow, and black, the four basic colors of additive color printing. So, you know, the thing is very reflexive to itself. The, the, the devices of light and color are also devices that signify in their own way some sense of the passionate or the erotic, you know, the flames of passion. This very cliched sign with the heart and the arrow and then this woman in her vivid red dress exaggerated with the lights. This actually, I put this in because it simply demonstrates to you more than any of these others, uh, given that I seem very often to work at night, and uh, probably A, because I like to work at night, and B, because the darkness allows me to start from nothing and begin to insert sources of illumination to construct an image. But this being made in the, in the daytime shows you something which probably isn't so evident in these other works, which is how peculiarly you have a picture construction using this variable depth of field, which is unlike something I think you normally see. And that is, if you look, at, this, is, this is a man on the right, his nose in the foreground quite out of focus, his eye comes sharply in focus. As soon as you get beyond that to his ear, you've gone out of focus again. On the left, in that hand, there's um, a mirror like, um, you know, a mirror um, that you might have in your handbag or whatever for applying lipstick. The woman holding the mirror is now in sharp focus. Again, as soon as we go beyond that, the figures behind, there's a woman with a baby, uh, behind, that's all out of focus. And curiously, once again, it slips back into focus with that woman wearing dark glasses in the background. In, in a way, I, these, these works often do refer to our actual behavior optically. 
in certain situations. I mean, a situation like this, you might well decide to look at this person and then be diverted and look at that person and then be diverted again and attend to somebody else. You know, you, you, you simply cannot, of course, see all of those people in sharp focus at once. The eye won't allow that to happen. So the camera here is working a little bit like the eye and it's reflecting something of one's actual behavior in such situations. But um, setting aside, I don't know, something like paintings of Vermeer where seemingly by the use of a camera obscura you get different focal points within a painting or in cinema it's possible to use a lens which does give you two different points of focus within a film frame. I'm not aware of um, images around which do more than that and I thought that was interesting and maybe a little strange that that didn't happen. This is called Wrong and it's the last slide of this particular group I want to show. Again, no people, just lights. Again, three kinds of lights. A light bouncing off that tilted window frame looking from an interior outwards. The light of that burning cross in the garden. The lights of a Christmas tree reflected inside the room and reflected on the interior of the window glass and shot through uh, a cross screen filter which turns all the little lights into little crosses. So we've actually got an image not just made of lights but also made of crosses. You know, this big cross of the tilted window frame, like a cancellation mark. The, the little crosses on the tree and then that big burning cross. It's full of cancellations, you know, because this cross also means wrong, like the title. And wrong in other senses. I mean, morally wrong, you might suppose, if at Christmas time and in front of a church, which is in the background, we've got this blazing cross and that picture was made on a Sunday. Also photographically wrong in that the exterior suffusion of blue is there because I used a film balance for artificial light. So the daylight takes on this sort of rather lurid blue color. Wrong because precisely of establishing this depth of focus that we keep talking about. Um, I thought what had happened with these works was that these pictures had opened up their illusionary and narrative space in, a, in an overwhelming degree. And I felt I didn't want that. I felt I wanted a much more declarative sense of the presence of the object, the photograph in whatever medium. Now, um, the way I started to try and solve that problem was make not a triple exposure but a double exposure and to try and relegate the interesting picture information only to the edge and release the center as a kind of, uh, you know, a zone of no interest or little interest. Now you see how inept I'm being because I can't get the two figures on the left and right side of the picture and get all the other things I want. So I'm having to settle in this case for having my zone of little incident in the entire left-hand half of the image. But nevertheless, it's a kind of starting point. The, um, the two figures are illuminated in a reverse fashion. The, the more central figure illuminated from behind so that her dress becomes fairly translucent and you can see the outline of her body. So a very womanly, almost erotic image. The figure on the right has a very different kind of garment, very awkward, um, uh, opaque, um, and you can see she's got this, it's actually a teddy bear, strange teddy bear behind her back. So they have a very different kind of reading. In fact, of course, as you might imagine, this is the same figure, it is the same moment in time, and there is simply a mirror at the end of that corridor. So we're seeing the front and rear view of the same figure, and the lighting, which is the same lighting, is simply 
between the reflection and the foreground figure. So it automatically gives them this reverse illumination. Now, th this is better. I mean, I'm kind of getting slightly better at this. So th this is a double exposure. Um, and the, the center now is unfocused. So I've, ex I've made a shot of the figure on the right, let's say, in focus, changed the point of focus, and made a second exposure on top of the first. Now, while I'm doing that, something happens. In that intervening time, something happens. Now, this, this piece of work has a title, Chiasmus. Chiasmus is um, a figure of language. And it's, it's a complete inversion in language from, um, well, I'll give you an example. It's the example in my Collins Dictionary, which is the basis for this work. And in the Collins Dictionary, the example of Chiasmus is he, on the right, he went in and out comes she on the left. Now, if you look at this image beyond the first glance, you might realize that this figure, once again, is the same person. It's the same figure. It's someone who goes in. And moreover, they've got identically patterned bags. It's a kind of joke. You know, the figure goes in on the right. In the time taken to change the focus and to make a second exposure, there's a change of clothing. And then that figure emerges on the door, in the door, through the door, on the left, as a woman, which is what she is. So, you know, again, he went in and out comes she. It's a complete inversion of tense, preposition, and gender. And we've got this released middle. It's not enough. So to continue this, what it really is, I think, is a desire to erect a kind of barrier to forbid this entry, a conventional entry, into the illusory space of the picture. And this is what I meant when I said at the beginning this notion of, of depth of field, of depth of focus, is something that um, exists for me initially, clearly, as an interest to, um, to, to control the spectator's relation to the image, the, the space in which they perceive it. It's also an interest in examining the this very illusory space I'm now denying or wishing to deny. And in, in, in doing that, of course, what it does is move photography into precisely where I don't want it to be, which is purely into the realm of image, the imaginary, the illusory, and away from any experience of the discernible presence of the object. Now, Rightly or wrongly, this is clearly something I desire to have, this discernible presence. So forbidding entry to what you would like to see continues here. Now, again, we've got a kind of mirror inversion. Because what you see is a single shot. This is no longer a double exposure. It's the same shot. The woman is actually reflected in a mirrorized wall, which is so that she faces um, the man, the paparazzo photographer. Now, what, as the flash goes off, as his flash goes off, on the right, it actually backlights itself and creates this black oval across the woman's face. As it does that, it also, seen directly, uh, bleaches out into a reverse, a white oval, across the man's face. So this overexposed woman's face, this bright face, female, with a black mask, inverts to this dark 
male face of the photographer with a white mask. <coughs> and, and, I mean, writing about this, I, I think, you know, I'm saying, if this is a paradigm of uh, a portrait shot, portraiture then is the very thing that is denied. The identity of the characters is what's missing. This is, I, I was kind of uncertain whether to put this in, I decided on balance I would. And this is very, very simple. It's a way of eradicating that central picture space in the most simple way uh, by using light, again, the illuminator of the image, but to use it also as an absence. And in this cinematech interior, the, the film is running, but the picture hasn't started. It's just transparent leader. The curtain's not even gone back. There's nothing to see there. It's a kind of absence. The only thing to see is the usherette, who, again, is right on the edge of the picture. It's called main feature. So, the, well, I, I, let, me just, let me just go on because, I, okay, well, this is what I really wanted to go on to. Let, let me just go on again. Um, this, is, this is how this is. The first slide I showed you was of a kind of working maquette, and I'll, I'll go back to it for convenience. It's, it's then made as um, an inkjet print onto vinyl. So this is three meters high. And that's, that's what it looks like when it's actually exhibited. It gives you a better sense of it. But if I just go back. Now, this, this idea of putting something on the edge developed into something almost like a formula for denial. And I wanted to use, I don't know, I mean, I had, a, I had an idea of doing work with forbidden images because I wanted to f forbid this access to the spectator. But I also wanted to somehow repeat that through the subject matter. Now, the, what, what you see is two separate shots made of an identical um, subject, let's say although this woman is being treated very much as an object for the camera in this case. Um, except one is conventionally sharply focused, the other is not. It's as out of focus as I could go from that position with that camera and that lens. And what I've done is very simply put the central part of the out of focus image over the central part of the in focus image, concealing the main part of the body. Presumably, I'm concealing the very part of that image that you would like to see, that you would like to have knowledge of. If we think of the central panel for a moment as an individual picture without knowledge of the periphery, my thought was that it would then be construed as an archetype of an erotically displayed figure, affirmed by the fact of it being on a red ground and by this soft focusness. If we then are allowed, if we're permitted to extend beyond the limits of that original frame around this border, we see a very different story. The red ground not an erotic ground at all, but a very bloody ground indeed. The clothes of the figure pulled right to the edge, as all really readable parts of this image are. And even the limits of the limbs, subject to a certain amount of grazing, scratching, and bruising, which are visible. So it's a very, it's a very, very different reading, a contradictory reading. But in, 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 a, in the sense of picturing, what I wanted to do was um, displace certain elements conventional to this idiom, the idiom of photography specifically. One uh, property is that of apparent transparency. 
And the central part of that image now is relatively opaque. It's like an opaque screen. Something else conventional is the figurative. Now, relatively speaking, that central panel is an abstraction from the figure. And another convention would be that the, the most important part of the picture, that which we want to see and that which is most sharply focused, should be in the center, and it's not. It's literally made peripheral. The peripheral, the unfocused, is now put into the center. Now, that thinking then continues through this work. So this is, you know, now we're really into what I call a denial of this original interest in notions of depth of field, the way it's perceived and constructed. So, again, that which you would, I think, most desire to, to have knowledge of, the identity of the central figure, is missing. The, f the figure, the man, is looking at a small poster which is attached directly to a window and therefore, from our point of view, completely covers the central part of his face. He is actually um, in front of the wall parallel to the window, which is a reflective surface. And we see the back of his head, but that's all we see. We even see a sliver of what he's looking at, the very edge of the image on the poster. We even see, from our point of view, because of the lighting, through the back of the paper, a sense of what that image is bleeding through. But we don't really see it. We have a perception of this rather ghost-like, um, rather emblematic figure. It's, it's sort of, it's a bit like um, an identikit figure, the kind of thing the police used before PhotoFit, and you know, they use something else now as well. Um, and there is some comparability between the man behind the glass and as far as we can discern, the image on the poster. This similar, the, the black um, rectangle in front of the man's face is actually a, re a rear lit card. You know, all these cards we're very familiar with, seeing them in the phone boxes, these advertisements for prostitutes. Um, so again, his face is concealed. It's a kind of censoring device the card he's looking at is actually reverse reflected in a mirror in the box and it says in reverse lettering for your eyes only which which i interpret as being definitely don't touch no touching only looking and it seems very in accord again with this idea of distance unlike you know all the other pictures which you did do with whipping and beating and, you know, all of that. Very hands-on. Now, photography, if you look for a literal definition of it, actually means drawing or writing with light. Now, as with a lot of these other works I've shown, the, the light required to make the picture is a visible part of the picture. It's part of what you read. And you know, if you take that notion of reading and extend it to the notion of writing with photography, this is exactly what happens here. So what, what I've done in this case, again, is make an image twice. But in one of these pictures, I've simply moved the camera. I've deliberately blurred the image in order to erase it. But that act of erasure has been done in a certain way. The camera movement has created a new image and not simply a negative absence. If you look in the, the bottom part of this picture, there's a, there's a doll, there's a child's shoe, but there's also some lights and they're reflected in the wet paving. And to the right of those lights, there's also a blue light. So what we're seeing is a reflection of car headlights and also a blue light. What's concealed, what's uh, been removed, is the image of a police car. What's appeared, of course, 
in making that erasure is a sign, a code, which is actually the equivalent of the same thing, 999. So the, the, the two headlights and the flashing blue beacon of the car have been turned into this signal. And it seems to be in accord with everything else we see. There's another child's doll in the shrubbery. There's a door just open with a child's ball there. And the work is called Gone. And these, these works also use another form of electronic imaging. The, the works that I talked about using um, an inkjet printing technique use a computer system for digitizing and replicating images. The, this also uses electronic imaging at a more fundamental source because it's a convenience to, for example, to, uh, to make a, co a, a composite image from two Id identical yet differently made pictures, that is again a blurred and a clear image, uh, and also to put that line round, which I wanted as a device of separation and also to introduce the center panel as also a picture in its own right. And again, an abstraction, an opaque panel, um, and something which ordinarily might be merely peripheral brought into the center. In this image, the three background figures are making a signal. They're all armed with flashlights, yellow flashlights, and they all signal towards us, towards me, the person making the picture. Now you can see in the foreground, there's a kind of pit or grave. And you can also see there's, um, there's an electric socket with three plugs with wires going back, and they're going to those the three lights that source the image in the middle. So that pit or trench or grave is illuminated. The, what I've done with my camera is also made a six. Now if you think about it, if you move a rigid frame like that as a six in front of fixed points of light, what you get as a trace on the film is a precise inversion of those lights and of your movement. So a six goes upside down and left to right and turns into a nine. So this work is called Call and Response. So my response to their call, 666, is 999. So their um, you know, numerological number of the devil is turned into something more innocently, a 999 emergency signal. So. I, w I wanted this uh, understanding of what's going on here to be quite different. And their outdoor clothing, which is ho hooded, turns rather conveniently into something a little ritualistic. Now this is, um, this is made in uh, the same place where I showed the image from the old tobacco factory. Krems in Lower Austria. And Krems is known as a region for producing very good wine. So there are vineyards all around and even within the town. I was actually asked there to, uh, I was actually asked there to make a piece of work which would be included in this present exhibition. And this is, um, this is what I made. Uh, or rather, actually this is what I made but let's go back to this because it's more clear. Again, it's made in that same way I described by making a deliberately blurred and clear image of exactly the same shot. There are nine women, the middle three obscured through blurring. If you remember what I said about the literal meaning of photography, drawing or writing with light, once again, we've got a coded signal. It's Morse code, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. It's the international emergency distress signal, which I read the other day has just been discontinued. And there it is. I, I mean, I showed the other slide because 
These were taken at dusk. And dusk is a very short period of time. It's like 20 minutes. Um, so in order to get what I wanted, I took more than one picture. So this is, this is pretty much on the limit of doing something which has legibility. But I, but I actually prefer it. This is called Nocturne, which is actually the name of that wallpaper. And it's very simple. It's just a close-up and a long shot from the same position. So there's, there's a part of that wall, dead center, which is undefiled. And when photographed as a detail and placed in an enlarged version over the other picture. Of course, you know, it's, it's very nice. It's like a sample, um, you know, with connotations of niceness. You know, this is what you would like to put in your country cottage on the wall. It's quite an expensive wallpaper as well, nocturne. And then in long shot, you can see this notion of niceness, of, you know, of a pleasant home is actually destroyed by this defiling process with graffiti and shit and tomato ketchup and you know all kinds of and trashed crockery and clothing on the floor and so on it's been really somebody's done a really good job this is the last thing I'm going to show um, it's called debate and the debate is not just what's going on in the background. The figures in discussion uh, apparently choosing paintings. Um, and there, there is actually something going on behind there. There is, a, there is actually a, a situation where someone is presenting paintings to be chosen, and they are discussing the paintings as they appear. But we're not allowed to see that. There's another kind of debate, and it's about picturing. And again, you've got those same elements. You've got a, an exchange between what should be peripheral, a kind of zone of no incident, and what should be central, which is now moved to the periphery, which is all the legible figures and what's going on there. There's also uh, a kind of narrative image, and there's also a completely non-narrative image. There's also a seemingly transparent image, the scene around the edge, and there's also a completely opaque image, the central panel. The, we've got the, so we've got the convention of figuration, transparency, narrativity all around the edge. That central panel is an abstract painting. It's a completely gray monochrome. It's also the gray of the photographer's gray card. The title is actually debate brackets, 18% reflectance. The photographer's gray card has a quality of 18% reflectance of light. It's calculated as the average uh, of colors in, a, in any situation. So you can conf confidently take your reading off this gray card and make a reasonably average exposure. So there's a debate also here now between painting and photography as well. So there are, there are a number of debates going on in the image. Brian and I are due to have a debate, and it's uh, a convenient place to stop showing slides, unless uh, I've exhausted all our time, Brian.